So what do we need to do to actually move the needle? Now, one of the things that, and one of the ways I like to frame this quite honestly, is that, you know, we do the scan of our, of our clubs, but we're business people. We're business leaders in our community. And if you were to think about your own business and you were to take a look at your business plan for the next three to five years, and you saw that you had a market share that was underperforming, you'd make course corrections, wouldn't you? And so as we look at the population of our globe, 50% of the, the global population, basically it splits down the middle, male, female. But in our organization, globally, 24% of our members are women. And so, you know, it isn't necessarily that we have to run after trying to get every woman in. We need to make sure that we get good members in, men and women. But we have an underperforming market share that we have an opportunity to, to take a look at and see how we can better reflect that within our clubs. Now, 24% is the, the global uh, statistic, but in North America, particularly in our own area, that generally is more like about 35%. Now, we also know that in parts of the, uh, the world, like the Caribbean, for example, um, they've basically, in many of those countries, achieved gender parity already. And so that's an, an, important, uh, an important statistic for them, uh, and they've been doing a lot of work on it. Now, members under the age of 40, again, a population where we've seen little growth. The Elevate Rotor Act movement has been an incredible opportunity for us to more meaningfully engage younger professionals in our organization. And we know just listening to, to Sam, and, and I know that there's a Rotor Act club that came into the, uh, into the chat room a few minutes ago, the, the opportunity for us to recognize that Rotor Act is now a membership type of Rotary is something that helps to bring them so much closer to us. Over the years, We've only ever actualized, if you can believe this, a transition from Rotaract to Rotary of 5%. How is it that we can have this population of people who, who understand Rotary, who get it, that it's part of their DNA, but then unfortunately, you know, have maybe a young family, go off to school, get a job, and aren't able to participate in their Rotaract club or transition into a Rotary club? And so we've got to do something to make that, that a, closer, a closer alignment. And so the entire movement of Elevate Rotaract over the past couple of years has been fundamentally important to engaging Rotaractors in a much more meaningful way. And at the end of the day, whether it's a Rotaractor or a Rotarian, the number one thing I think we need to do is to ensure that we do take a good look at our clubs to see what it is that we're offering and to make sure that the experience that we're providing is what people are looking for. We know from research that people join and people stay because of the service opportunities that we have to get our hands into something and for fellowship and connectivity and connection. And so we need to make sure that we provide an authentic and intentional experience for our members. And that means that when, when someone comes to our club, you know, perhaps the best thing we can do is ask them what do they want from the experience and then help deliver on what it is that they've requested. You know, we spend a lot of time telling clubs to do an exit interview when someone's leaving, when instead we really should be doing an entrance interview to find out what it is that they want and then honor, then honor that. So we, we've done a lot of work. We kind of know the statistics. Um, and one of the other things that I think from the, the area and the perspective of, of bringing younger members into Rotary, I think, and this is one of the ways I like to think of it, is, you know, it's not necessarily a campaign to bring younger members in. I believe what we should be more focused on is young thinkers, people who think young. Have you, have you, have you ever met a 25-year-old who's old? Have you met an 86-year-old who's young? I think you know what I'm saying. We need people who are progressive in their thoughts, who are forward-thinking. And when we have that, that type of member in our club, it helps to make us grow, to flourish, to bloom. And so vibrant clubs are those that are taking a look forward, the, the kind of clubs that don't say, eh, it's not the way we've always done it. So diversity, the final thought that I want to wrap up here with this topic is that all of these different um, 
demographics that we're, we're looking at, trying to include and, and be more inclusive in our organization. We know that we don't have a problem with attracting. We really have a problem with keeping people. Our numbers bear it out. More than 1.3 million have joined over the past decade and we're still at 1.2. That means we've lost more than we've actually welcomed into our, into our organization. And so we need to do a little bit of work about, like I said, what our clubs, what our clubs look like. And so the final thought is, in my estimation, it really is a conversation about diverse perspective. That's what's so unique to what we have as an organization, that we are able to solve the world's most pressing challenges because we see things in a unique way. And everyone has a different way of bringing a, a resolution to a problem to the table. Imagine if you, if you would, if, if we were all bankers or we were all lawyers or we were all doctors, we would all look at things through one lens. But because we bring a very diverse perspective, it's what allows us to solve these pressing challenges. It's what makes us stand out we are able to tackle things like polio because we aren't um, like government. We aren't um, political. We aren't religious. We are able to bring together from every people from every walk of life, every continent and culture to be able to work together in harmony. And I don't know about you, but one of the things that I am so immensely proud of is how we have responded over the past eight or nine months since we all went into collective lockdown that literally at a time when every man, woman, and child on our planet was facing this incredibly um, terrible virus and what it's meant. But one of the things we didn't have to do was to say to the family of Rotary that we need you to be people of action because you know what? You showed us that you already were. Jumping onto platforms like this to be able to talk and, and get, get together to make sure that we're looking out for our, our neighbors, our community, our family, our Rotary family, and making sure that no one's left behind, that no one's isolated, and no one is in, in great need. And that's perhaps one of the things that I think is, is most um, special right now is the fact that we are taking time to reach out to those in our clubs to make sure that they're okay. Um, trying to make sure that people are getting onto platforms like this because you know right now even though we have hope on the horizon like governor david told us at the beginning we have hope on the horizon it's still a few months or maybe several away and so we need to make sure that we are all in this together and that we're making sure that we walk arm in arm shoulder to shoulder pulling everyone along with us so that we all come out of this knowing that it was a difficult thing to go through but perhaps we've been able to learn. Perhaps we're maybe better for it. Perhaps there are different ways to connect and to communicate that have now been found in a way to adapt, ability to adapt that uh, we never really knew possible. And so today I wanna to thank you all. I wanna thank you all for being leaders in our organization, for understanding that Rotary is a very special part of all of our DNA and for understanding that service is something that is meaningful in your life. So thank you to each and every one of you for your gifts and for being members of Rotary International.